Good morning and welcome to Westminster Online. It is wonderful to have you be part of our community this morning. Please join Pastor Martha and me in the call to worship. In the midst of a world where people hunger and thirst, we come to worship a God who feeds the hungry. In the midst of a world where people are oppressed and abused, we come to worship a God who calls for compassion and justice. In the midst of a world filled with wars and the rumor of war, we come to worship a God who desires nothing less than peace for the world. In the midst of a world of spiritual emptiness, we come to worship a God who gives life meaning. We give thanks and worship the God whose grace and love knows no end. Amen.
Please join Imre and me as we sing our hymn, Take Thou Our Minds, Dear Lord. If you were trying to reach us here at the church in this past week, uh, we had a major problem with our internet. Uh, AT&T shut us down and we were down for more than two days. So if you have sent emails, we did not receive them. Um, so if there's something you need to let us know, please resend or give us a call in this coming week. We apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, it was inconvenient for everybody <laughs> involved. So as we go to joys and concerns, we give thanks. We were telling you that Bruce had moved out of the hospital and he has. He is now at Skyline Healthcare and Wellness Center. If you would like to call him and speak to him there. My friends, let us pray. Holy and loving God, we come to you today with the prayers of the heartbroken, the hopeful, and everyone in between. We thank you that you know us and love us and meet us where we are. We ask that you bring comfort, hope, and healing to the heartbroken. God, hold our fragile hearts as many are hurt from medical conditions, the loss of loved ones, deep loneliness and isolation, and other things that bring pain into their lives. Return to us the joy of your salvation so, th so that our mourning may turn into dancing. We thank you that we do see signs of hope and an end to this pandemic. We continue to grieve our losses as we remember those countries that are experiencing devasta devastation and, and so many deaths, especially India and Brazil. God grant us patience and wisdom and wise discernment as we navigate life. Help us to balance our needs as we also do our best to keep others safe. We ask for all people to be treated justly and with dignity, that violence may cease. God, this is another tough and exhausting week. We want to see the light at the end of the tunnel, yet mass shooting and tragic deaths continue. May the pain not break us. Give us the tools to do what you require of us, to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. As we walk with you, O Lord, remind us that you walk with us. We are not alone. We hope because you are with us. May we feel your embrace and comfort as we navigate the troubling waters of this world. We ask for reminders that spark joy in our lives from the things we eat to the things we hear, give us reminders that you are not done working in this world and that redemption and resurrection are at work. 
we trust in this, the unfailing love of your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation you will see printed on your screen. Because you made the world and intended it to be a good place and called its people your children, because when things seemed their worst, you came in Christ to bring out the best in us. So gracious God, we gladly say, goodness is stronger than evil. Because confusion can reign inside us despite our faith. Because anger, tension, bitterness, and envy distort our vision. Because our minds sometimes worry small things out of proportion. Because we do not always get it right. We want to believe love is stronger than hate. Because we shy away from hurtful truths because it is easy to ignore the suffering of others, because we deny our own responsibility, we trust that light is stronger than darkness. Because you have promised to hear us and are able to change us and willing to make our hearts your home, we ask you to confront, control, forgive and encourage us as you know best then let us cherish in our hearts what we proclaim with our lips. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Truth is stronger than lies. Amen.
please join with me in the prayer for illumination. O God of the weak, O God of the lonely, O God of the righteous, speak now through your word. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the third chapter of Paul's second letter to Timothy, beginning at verse 10. Listen for the word of God. This is Paul's charge to Timothy. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness my persecutions and suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Over the last year, our country has been struggling mightily. Almost a year ago, George Floyd died on a city street, and the police officer who had his knee on his neck for nine minutes was found guilty of his murder the week before last. But George Floyd's death also reinvigorated the Black Lives Matter movement and our session and congregation began an intentional study on the problems of white privilege, of race, of racism, and challenging inequities that come with those issues. Today, Martha and I are starting a new sermon series based on five challenging inequities that our session has determined that Westminster can be involved in in bringing equality and unity into our community and the world. Those areas are education, um, economic disparity, health, housing, and incarceration and detention. Over the next uh, weeks of this month, we will consider what our responsibility is based on the Bible and our own faith experience. To be honest, confronting racism is hard. It's hard. And because of the immense diversity of people here in Southern California, I think we can pretend that it's not really an issue. But then uh, I read a remembrance of Bob Johnson it was in the newspaper just 10 days ago um, who confronted racism here and wrote about it. Uh, Bob Johnson came to California when he was nine years old uh, and his parents bought a house and lived in Glendale. Glendale in 1940 was a, a sundown town a municipality where uh, blacks and people of color had to be outside the city limits 
at sunset. He also, uh, in his research, um, discovered that a century before, Henry W. Head uh, was an assemblyman in Los Angeles County. And he was the man who brought the papers to Los Angeles that officially split Los Angeles and Orange County from each other. It turns out that Henry W. Head was a founding member of the Ku Klux Klan with Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. You know, it's not really a surprise when you think about it that way that this has been a problem for a very long time. We had problems here in Pasadena as well. Watch this clip from the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite as he describes what happened here in Pasadena 50 years ago. The school busing controversy took two forms in California today, the start of a massive busing program in Pasadena and the signing of a state anti-busing law to take effect November 21st. Terry Drinkwater reports. Governor Ronald Reagan set the stage today for another court test in California of busing to achieve school integration. He signed a bill to outlaw busing without the consent of the parents of each student. Judicial rulings intended to force compulsory busing on parents and families against their wishes and without their consent have distressed the vast majority of our citizens who strongly oppose racial discrimination, but who understandably view mandatory busing as a ridiculous waste of time and public money which could seriously undermine all efforts to improve the quality of our public schools. Besides hampering the quality of education our children need and deserve by siphoning off millions of dollars in school funds which could otherwise be used for books, new classrooms, teachers, and maintenance, forced busing would also deprive them of the natural environment of the neighborhood school. The very day the governor signed the anti-busing bill into law, the most extensive busing program ever undertaken in a city outside the South began in Pasadena, California. Here the court had ordered integration. 15,000 students were moved by bus. Half of the youngsters who live in the district commuting to school today for the first time. There was some slight confusion, delays, as neither drivers nor youngsters knew quite where they were supposed to go. Most parents seemed to go along with the plan. A few did not. I don't like it, not with the taxes, and we're within walking distance of three schools right here that uh, we have to bus our children. We're strictly against it right now. I am for it. I think it's the answer to Pasadena's problems. The youngsters generally seem to like the new plan. More of them were in schools dominated by their own age group. Kindergarten through third grade in one school, grades four through six in another, and so on. There were no racial incidents, no friction between the youngsters. Despite the calm on the campuses, the specter of buses is a major political issue in Pasadena. Three school board members who worked on the plan now face a recall election. One of the candidates challenging them is Frank Crowhurst. Well, Judge Reel passed a decision against the uh, Pasadena school board that we felt was unconstitutional. Now, we feel that the school board should have appealed that decision. They didn't do it. So we have started a recall election, and that's what we're having. Uh, we live in a free and open society, and this is what Mr. Nixon has said also. Uh, and I think because of that, uh, that we should have our right to choose our, our own neighborhood, our own neighborhood schools. Well, I think the recall was always an unfortunate thing for the community, not because I'm involved, but because it tears the community apart. Now, what will happen in the election is something that I am unable to predict at this time. But I do think that it will be a fruitless effort, no matter how you look at it, because the decision basically was the judge's decision. But you expect to be back uh, after the recall. You expect to win. I expect to be, uh, but at the same time, I would like to say that it's a touch-and-go situation. The political issues are far too complicated, of course, for these five-year-olds leaving McKinley Elementary School this afternoon by bus for home. But with the anti-busing bill signed today by the governor, and with the new militants of the recall campaign here, the Pasadena integration battle is far from over. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Pasadena. Of course, the discussion of busing began before September 14th, 1970, and apparently there was a, a lot of emotion and upheaval. 
Norm Haynes and a friend of his, uh, Warren McElwain, both members here, um, but Norm's remembered that when he and Warren did a, a good cop, bad cop comedy routine at a Wednesday night dinner. But their routine was based on uh, race, and they went back and forth uh, covering the history of kidnapping people from, from Africa up to the present day. And what surprised Norm, as he told me, was that afterwards, some people came up because they didn't know all of the, the facts that they had shared in their, their routine. It was supposed to be funny, but it turned out to be educational. A lot of people in Pasadena still disagreed. They disagreed with busing, they disagreed with the idea, and they left. At that time, Arcadia, La Cañada, San Marino, they were, they were white communities, um, all white, and they all grew from the white flight of people leaving here. One of the issues, though, of people leaving was that there was a glut of houses on the market, and it made it possible for other people to move into Pasadena, which they did, and many of them joined Westminster. Um, and we, there are some still here today that, that came in with that. The issue of, of busing was a big issue, and one of our elders, Laverne Lamotte, uh, was also on the school board. Laverne supported busing. So did our session, and so did our congregation. In fact, the majority of children in Westminster's congregation attended public schools, and many of our children experienced busing in those days to achieve racial integration. Again, Norm Haynes told me that his children found it uh, beneficial. In their experience, they learned more than just their school subjects. They learned to appreciate the content uh, of, of children, of youth, they, they appreciated the content of their character, not just the color of their skin. Which brings me to our lesson from 2 Timothy today. Though he didn't know it, Timothy was richly blessed. He was brought up by a, a believing and devout mother and grandmother. He was raised in a home where God was honored. He could watch his mother and grandmother and see from them how they lived out their faith, how the, the words of the Bible were expressed in everyday life. In the same way, as I read, Paul said, look at me. Look at what kind of person I am because of the God I serve and the teaching I proclaim. It really should come as no surprise that the church has historically promoted education and the improvement of the mind. That doesn't mean that it's easy. Paul had been a, a devout Pharisaic Jew who grew up teaching and rejecting everyone who was outside his narrow prescribed faith. As a Pharisee, Paul would never have associated with a Jewish person who'd married an outsider, a Greek, a Roman, anyone. They were unclean. They were good for nothing but work and service. When Paul became a follower of Jesus, he started to learn that all people, all people are created in the image of God. It was a hard lesson for him. Timothy was a, a mixed-race son of a Jewish woman and a Greek man. But because of Jesus, Paul cherished Timothy and taught him and the very last verses we heard today. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful. The Bible, however, uh, was written by over 40 authors 
over a period of a, of a thousand years. And some of the people who wrote the Bible were prophets or kings. Others were shepherds or farmers or fishermen. Still others were, were medical doctors, tax collectors, or, or civil servants. And when you read their writings, you can easily recognize their personality, their strengths, their weaknesses, and with their all, two human emotions. You can always say that the Bible is a collection or a library of through and through human beings. So how is it inspired by God? How is it useful? When we look at the Bible, we quickly realize that there is no standard or fixed pattern of inspiration. Therefore, different texts require a different approach. When we read or study the Bible, we must keep in mind the mode of inspiration, the context, the target group, and the intention of the author. Unfortunately, this is where our, the church has failed in our edu education of, of, of some people because there are, there's a large group of people that have a very one-dimensional view of the Bible. Whatever text they pick, it is God's word to them, literally. And so it could happen that God's command to Joshua to, to conquer the promised land and destroy the people who lived there, or at least make them slaves, was taken as God's command for the European immigrants to America or Africa. Imperialism and slavery were, were sanctified through a, a twisted reading of the Bible. We have to remember that what was meant for Israel 3,000 years ago is not always 100% applicable to us today. It all begins with education. Without education, we simply focus on the words and as the only way of conveying meaning. Literalism literally turns this book into a handbook that can be used as a weapon, promoting the, the purposes of, of people, not of God. We have to have an education to understand the principles that are being expressed behind the words and how they apply to us today. It's easy in our world to know a lot of information. Fifty years ago, no one would have as much information as I have at my fingertips with this little phone. There are a lot of words that come with that information. We all have to be aware of the principles that are desperately needed to apply the words, to understand them, to figure out how they are to benefit us and all of humanity. Like Timothy, people of all ages, all colors, all backgrounds, they need devout mothers and fathers. They need spiritual grandfathers and grandmothers. They need friends and mentors who are strong in the faith. We all need to see and know people who live faithfully, who do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. For as we watch and learn from them, we too recognize that all people are made in the image of God and are to be treasured. It's the operative part. To be treasured. I attended Wabash College, as did our son, Forrest. Wabash is a small, all-male, liberal arts college in rural Indiana. Wabash's mission is to educate men to think critically, act responsibly, 
lead effectively and to live humanely. I love that because the education has a purpose to improve lives by teaching people that what and how they think, live, act, and lead is what's most important. Education applies to everyone, everyone, regardless of race, nationality, or background. It's all irrelevant. Education is what we all need. We at Westminster can be proud of our history and heritage in supporting civil rights and the equality of all races in the schools here in Pasadena and Altadena. But the struggle is not done and continues to this day. So let us all continue to learn from this book and teach others by our devotion and faithfulness so that we can live out the love of God in all our relationships with our neighbors and loved ones and all those within God's creation so that one day we may all do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Let us pray as I use this prayer by W.E.B. Du Bois. Give us grace, O God, to dare to do the deed which we all know cries to be done. Let us not hesitate because of ease or the words of men's mouths or our own lives. Mighty causes are calling us the freeing of women, the training of children, the putting down of hate and murder and poverty, all these and more. But they call with voices that mean work and sacrifice and death. Lord Jesus Christ, give us the strength and courage to follow those words and to be your examples of faith, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with you, no matter who or what we encounter. For we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for being part of the Westminster community today. It is, it is a blessing to us, and we pray that you have found blessing through us as well. Loved ones, as, as you go out into the world this week, remember, Live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak gratefully, pray daily, and leave everything else up to God. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.
And don't forget to get vaccinated. Ow! Congratulations, you have made it to the end of the service. Until next week, be well. And God bless.